Well, we are in the series Deserted. So like what happens in the desert? What does the desert do to us? And today I'm going to be talking about what it's like to be running on empty. And as I was preparing and I don't like the desert. I don't like preaching about being in the desert. I don't like talking about it. It's, it's, I'll be honest, I feel like I'm preaching the same thing over and over and over again with the message of, are we trusting God? And I started thinking about it, you know, and how difficult the desert is. And um, <clears throat> sometimes when we're in the desert, we're in the place of drought, we develop emotions, emotions of anger, emotions maybe of resentment, um, disappointment, discouragement. It also is a revealing place. We've talked about that. It reveals something about ourselves. And maybe we don't know that it's even there until we're in the desert. And, and if we don't do something, this is, this is not planned. I'm kind of emotional. If we don't do something about our response to the desert and handle it the way that God is inviting us to handle it, then we're going to stay in a place where we really shouldn't be. Moving beyond that is, I really believe, what God is trying to do for our church right now. We are here. We are in the desert there's a reason this sermon series that we're going through it. What is God trying to teach us? I think God is trying to move us beyond where we are in our faith. And the question is, are we willing to do that? And I have rewritten this like four times, what I'm going to say today. I may follow a script, I may not. But I do know this, and I want you to be thinking about this. For those of you, God is speaking to some of you. God is calling some of you. God is asking some of you questions. And I'm going to go through a process, and when we come to the end, I'm going to open the altar. I've never, like, talked about this at the beginning of a sermon. It's kind of a spontaneous. But I believe that I want you to listen so that you know if you need to come down and, and give something to God or let go of something or respond to God in a way. So that's the stuff we're going to be talking about. It's very light, very, very light material. <laughs> Thank you, God for putting us here for so long. But before I do that, let me just pray for all of us. I know we've been praying, but God, I just specifically pray for a movement of the Holy Spirit, that we hear you, that we respond. Um, God, that <laughs> even if we don't want to uh, give ourselves completely over to you, but I pray that you shine the light on the places in our lives so that we can become powerful, strong people of faith that make a difference in this world, who partner with you and, and come alongside you rather than us going in our own direction. Well, we are in the center, Lord, of your perfect will, whether it's, it's, it feels like so unsafe and so uncertain. But Lord, with you, where else would we want to be? So God, I pray that you just help us hear you this morning. Amen. <clears throat> so I used to drive a brown car, a gremlin. Who said that? You must be old. Sorry. <laughs> but I drove it, so there you go. Um, I drove a brown gremlin that looked just like that. It's not mine, but it looked just like that with that gold stripe. And um, I, <laughs> I think it was in 1976. And if those, those of you who don't know what a gremlin is, just count yourself blessed. It's like the worst car I ever drove in my life. No, it was. No, there was one other one that was pretty bad, but this was. And those of you young people who are driving really nice cars, you know what? That's not right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> like my car would break down all the time, and I'm not kidding. And I used to drive a Toyota that literally, <laughs> to get it, I didn't want to stop at a red light because if you stopped at the red light, it would stall. So I would always bring my friends with me so they could get out and push the car. It was a stick shift. Yeah, anyway car stories. Um, so this Gremlin was not a fun car, and it would, uh, when I would drive it to school, they, I had to get up 30 minutes early if it was raining because I had to blow dry the distributor cap. Like, <laughs> seriously. 
So anyway, and if you don't know what a distributor cap is, shame on you, but that's another story. So I would drive this gremlin and it got 12 miles to the gallon. I had it all timed out because I knew how much it had because I didn't make very much money. And in our family, everybody had to pitch in and pay for whatever they were doing. So I had, to, I had a little job at the Eskimo Queen in downtown Plain City, Ohio, and I didn't make very much money. So money was uh, short. And, and so to, I, t I checked like how many miles to the gallon I was getting and it was only 12. So I would go to the gas station and I would take like change out of my pocket when you could do that. And I would like throw it on the counter like $1.25. They hated me at the gas station in Plain City. Like they're always counting it. Because I was always running on empty. My car was always on E. It was like right before, you know, and you're like, oh, I better go get another dollar in. So I was always running on empty. And one weekend I was at my friend's house. And, <laughs> and I left there late. It was like 1 o'clock in the morning. And it's dark, obviously. Um, I'm driving home. I live in the country, so I'm on a country road, and I run out of gas because I was always running on empty. And so then, what do you do, young people? You pick up your phone, don't you? You call it. No. You, you're like, I'm in the middle of nowhere on a country road at night with no gas in my car, and I got to get out and go to someone's house and make a phone call. So I did. I get out of my car. I go walking down the road. I come to the first house. It was a trailer. I walk up the driveway. It was creepy. It was so creepy. And so I walk up and I, I go up on the porch. I'm like sketchy, you know, looking at, and I'm knocking. Imagine if you're in the trailer. You're like, who is this in the middle of the night? I knock on the door and I, I hear like all this movement in the background, the scuffling around, and I thought, oh, what's going on? And finally I heard this man, and this man said, who is it? And I'm like, oh, I ran out of gas, can I use your phone? And he finally opens the door, everything you would imagine that he looked like he did. His hair was a mess, he had on a robe, slippers, like pants on, and then a gun. Uh-huh, and so I, He's like, come on in. So I went in and I called my friend's dad who was closer than my own father. And he was so sweet. His name was Rick. And Rick came with this little gas can and put gas in. I'm still surprised that I made it home that night. But I was thinking about that. It's like this life of, some of us live our spiritual lives like that. We're always feeling like um, we don't have enough. We're running on empty. Every time we think of our life, it's a big E. We're so close to E. We're barely getting by. And, and I think what God is really, the Holy Spirit is trying to teach us as a church is we don't have to remain in that space of feeling like we're just getting by. We don't have to run and continue living our lives on empty spiritually. So if you're tired, if you feel like you have nothing left in your tank, I don't want you to give up. I believe God is challenging us to become people who trust him and are people of faith. And if it feels like we're repeating the same story over and over again, I think we are because I believe that that's what God is trying to tell us as a church. He wants to do something magnificent in you and through you and through this place. So we're going to go right now. We're going to go to 1 Kings and I'm going to read verses 1. I'm going to go through 1 tonight. What I'm going to do is as I read, I'm going to explain a few things and interject. So let's start with verse 1. Now Elijah was from Tishbe and Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. So Elijah was a prophet from God. God had told him that to pray that there would be no rain, and it happened. And so uh, Elijah followed what God said. And then it says in verse 2, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kareth Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. God has a unique way about him, but he was protecting him. He says, go over here by Kareth Brook. I want you to live there until, the, until all of this is over, and I want you to drink the water from there. And these ravens, who uh, according to the standards of the law, were unclean birds, these, these ravens are going to bring you food every single day in the morning and evening. So Elijah did as the Lord told him. 
And he camped beside Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan River. And the ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up. It's kind of the way life is. There's like provision, everything, God's taking care of us. And then all of a sudden, we come to a place where we're like, wait a minute, something's shifted, something's changed. I need help. And it says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go and live in the village of Zarephath, near the city of Sidon. I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So Elijah, the prophet, had been taken care of by natural means with the, with the brook, by unnatural, unclean ravens waitressing him and serving him every day. And then... Um, after the drought came or after it had been there for a while after a period of time he says now you need to move and you need to go and you need to find this woman so he goes to Zarephath which in the, uh, the original language it means refinery it means a workshop for melting and refining metals it kind of struck me that the place he was going was this place where this refinement would take place and I take that as, a, as an example of what was going to happen to Elijah and this woman. So the widow was a Gentile. Once again, um, if you know anything about the Hebrew law, the Mosaic law, she would have been considered unclean. So God's provision, just a note, can come from wherever God wants it to come from. Ravens and unclean women. To a Gentile woman, a foreigner who was unclean, unseen, utterly helpless, and hopeless, and running on empty. Let's learn about her. So he went to Zarephath, and as he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, Bring me a bite of bread, too. Do you guys have a husband like that? As soon as you get up to go get a glass of water, say, oh, wait a minute, honey, can you get? Anyway, I just think it's interesting that he was testing her. He's like, okay, I'll ask her for water, and then let's see if this is the widow that's supposed to be feeding me right now. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house, and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil on the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal, and then my son and I will die. God truly works in mysterious ways. Why would God send Elijah to someone who had nothing To give him everything. Well, here's what I want you to hear. God knew what she had. God knew what she didn't have. God knew how her impoverished state. God knew that she was trying to take care of her son. And God had spoken to her. So not only did God tell Elijah to go see her in verse 9 it says that I have instructed God said to Elijah I have instructed a widow there to feed you so she knew that God had spoken to her that she was to feed the prophet when the prophet came into her city and God was asking her to be generous even though she was poor She was making her last meal, but God asked her to give it away. The very last bit of sustenance that she had. That seems a little harsh until you know the bigger picture. But before we get there, I want you to think about something. No money, no food is no excuse for no giving. So God was asking her to be generous even though that meant giving away everything that she had. Now, 
I'm not saying that everybody who's listening to this is supposed to give away everything they have. And, and I'm not, but I'm saying if God wants you to do that, that's different. And, and just think about this. So we like to give offerings to God in response to what God has given us. So um, when we're blessed financially, it's pretty easy to give to God. But God was asking this woman to give out of her poverty. And, and it feels unnatural. But, but here is the thing about the kingdom of God. It's like living in the upside down. The kingdom of God doesn't make sense to us from a natural human perspective. The kingdom of God is living by the power and the spirit of God. And oftentimes, and most of the time, it doesn't look like what the world and what we think it should look like. There's a scripture that I often quote that said, if, it says, if you sow to the flesh, you'll reap death and destruction. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap life everlasting. So when we live and walk by the spirit and hear what the spirit says, then, then God is responsible and he reaps something beautiful when we follow what he says. God wanted her everything. So there's really a lesson here for us. Instead of giving out of our abundance, maybe God wants us to take it to another level. Maybe God is asking us to trust him to the point where we are willing to take risks and live courageously instead of trying to live and remain in our comfort zones. We can give God every single excuse on the planet. We can say, well, I don't have money. I don't have training. My family doesn't support me. I can't move. I don't have the time. But when God asks us for something or asks us to do something, there is no excuse we can give that is reasonable. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? You said the right thing because, he, because the only response that's viable when God asks us is yes. That's it. And I'm preaching this to me as well as all of you. Um, but if we want to stop running on empty, then we have to start walking by the Spirit. And and stop making excuses for why we're not doing what God is asking us to do. Because when you walk by the Spirit, you surrender self and the Spirit begins becoming very powerful in your life. So the second thing I noticed about this story is that faithfulness to God overpowers fear and brings breakthrough. So in verse 13... Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first, then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. He's like, listen, I'm going to take care of you until the rains come again. You're going to have everything you need. And, and the widow woman, you're not just going to have what you need for yourself, but for your son and Elijah, and it's going to continue. And he didn't say this. He didn't say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have loaves of bread for you uh, on your countertop every morning. He said, no, but I'm going to have oil and flour, and it's never going to run out until the circumstances change. If there was ever an emotion that prevents us from living the life God has called us to, it is fear. Fear is like a water hose that squelches any type of fire we have in our souls. When we are afraid, we focus on all of the negative outcomes and all the reasons why it's not going to work that could potentially happen. And we completely forget how God's promise to care for us is real and that we can trust our God. He promises that he will take care of us. I, have you guys ever been scared to do what God is asking you to do? It doesn't have to be big. I, I was uh, petrified. I used to be petrified to play the piano in front of anybody or like to lead a song so that people could sing along. It's weird. 
petrified. But I finally said, okay, God, I'm done. Like if you, if you, you know what I'm talking about if you're sitting there saying no to God because it, like, it's always this nagging thing in your soul. And so I finally said yes and then God started going, yeah, that's right. I want you to play that on that. They need a piano player. They need, and not only was I petrified about playing the piano, I was also petrified about singing. I was so petrified about singing that one time I was singing, they had asked me to sing a song in the choir and I had this lead out and, and um, I remember my legs were shaking so bad. They talk about, you know, knees knocking. That's no joke. But I had a robe on so nobody could see that my, they probably did. I probably looked like this. Um, I was petrified, but I said yes anyway. So you can have fear, but don't let fear be the thing that prevents you from doing what God's asking you to do. If he's asking you to do it, it's going to be great. He's going to provide for you. He's going to bless you. You're going to receive breakthrough that you never knew existed. I I was reading um, something about, I I did the search on missionaries who have had um, miraculous experiences. And listen, every missionary I know, they have to walk by faith. And I'm going to read you something. This gentleman, he lives in Scotland. And he, runs a, he has a church and he runs a ministry called 20 Schemes. This is the title of his article. We nearly go bankrupt every month, but God always provides. That sounds like stress on a platter. But listen to what he says. He said, in April, we had our annual church meeting and the treasurer stood up and told us that at current levels of giving, we're 12,000 pounds down. We'd had some massive bills come in that year. The church boiler had blown up. There had been unexpected expenses out of the blue. We'd also sent a lot of people from our church to plant churches elsewhere. When you're a small church like ours and you lose 10 or 15 people's giving, that has a big impact. If we'd continued spending with the same expenses, we'd have run out of money by the end of the year. That's, I've heard conversations like that, just so you guys know. Some of you in this room, we've had conversations. He says, this is our church's money, but it is, but it also belongs to the ministry that he runs. The treasurer said, people need to raise their giving. I sat in the meeting and said, we should give, but we also need to trust that the Lord will provide. The next day, a pastor at another church rang me and said, by the way, our church has made an offering to you of 12,000 pounds. He didn't know anything about the deficit. I told them that's exactly the amount of our shortfall, and we both laughed and praised the Lord. But then things like this happen all the time. He goes on to tell all these different stories. He said that the Lord is generous to those who are generous. And he said, I believe, I think many churches, many Christians in churches would probably see my view as unwise stewardship. I just don't see that. He goes on to say, the Lord never provides for a need that doesn't exist. Then he closed and he said, we don't necessarily wait until we have the money to give. We give and expect the money to come every time the Lord comes through. Have you been scared to do what God is asking of you? And if you have been, then I wonder what you've missed out on. Because I don't always act in faith. I don't always trust God. But I'll tell you what, when I do, that's when I experience the power of God. The power of God stepping in. The power of God coming through. I don't think we expect God to act on our behalf. But if we're following God, fully surrender God, then we should expect that. There's like this, this space, you know, we should, we should keep, we should always have this uh, place where we're moving toward and not remaining where we are. So how did the widow... In verse 15, that she did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. I I always think about that. I'm like, I would just have my eye on that olive oil and container of flour all the time going, did it move? I just poured a bunch out. Is there any? It lasted 
for days. But she finally got to the point where she let God become her only source. God was not a resource. God was her source. Her obedience during a drought became her opportunity to experience a miracle. Really how we act, and this is what I was saying earlier, how we respond to God and how we act in seasons of drought when we feel like we're running on empty, that will, will, will prove something about us as a follower of Christ. And, and I really believe God is saying, listen, there is something beyond. There is breakthrough beyond the drought. There is breakthrough beyond the desert. But you have to do it with the right attitude. And you have to trust me while you're in it. Because droughts lead to dependence on God. And dependence on God leads to blessing. So during our periods of drought, whether it be financial, physical, emotional, whatever drought we're experiencing, we have an incredible opportunity to listen to the Holy Spirit, to trust God, and then watch him work. And number four, you know, I, this is an important thing, and I, and I know that we have a, a variety of people that come to church here, and I want you to know that God sends people to us to bless us when we are in seasons of drought. And, and God uses his people to encourage one another. And it brings God great joy. And both Elijah and the widow were running on empty. Elijah had no food or water. And, and the widow had no faith. And God brought them together. Elijah helped her believe God and trust God and have the faith that she needed. And then she helped Elijah by giving him food and probably a place to stay. So if you feel as though you're running on empty today, I don't want you to cocoon yourself and to hide yourself from God and to hide yourself from God's people. That is not the answer. Because when you isolate yourself, you're not only preventing God from blessing you, but you are also interfering in how God wants to use you to bless others. We need each other. And I see it so clearly in this story. And if I'm going to be Elijah right now, which I'm not, but let's just say, with a word for you, it is, let's trust God together. Let's believe God for some things that we've never believed God for ever before. Let's believe that God will act on our behalf for the things that he's calling us to. And for those of you who are being called by God to surrender or to to follow God on a different path or whatever it is, I'm going to challenge you today to trust God, take a leap of faith, and step out and do what God is asking you to do. You will never, ever regret it. It will be the best decision that you've ever made. If you want to grow beyond your drought, stop making excuses. Don't allow fear to control you. Follow God's direction even when you're scared. Allow God to be your source and don't go to all your other resources. And don't isolate yourself from the church and other people of faith.